Okay, so if you feel comfortable um, having your video on, that makes it more fun. So if you can put your video on, that would be great. And uh, we'll go ahead and start, and we'll start with setting our motivation. Sange chodon sogi chonam pae janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi rola penche sange drupa sho sange chodon sogi chonam la janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi Rola penche sange rupa shom sange churon sogi churam la janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi rola penche sange rupa shom. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment, namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtues over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds, and not transgressing the bounds of the Pratamoksha, Bodhisattva, and Tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii, for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear, like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. So we go for refuge until we're enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By our merits from giving and other perfections, may we become Buddhas to benefit all sentient beings. And we revive our understanding of a perfection, paramita, that the six perfections are aspirations and activities directed toward achieving Buddhahood. Someone with uncontrived bodhicitta is called a bodhisattva, and this is what we aim to be. And we've already looked at generosity, the intention to give, ethics, restraint from harming, patience, forbearance with suffering, joyous effort, enthusiasm for beneficial actions, concentration, abiding with a beneficial object, and now we're up to wisdom, the realization of ultimate reality. So starting right off, getting our juices flowing a little bit, we need to ask ourselves, why? Why do we need the wisdom, realizing the emptiness of inherent existence? Why do we need this kind of wisdom? It's obvious that we need many kinds of wisdom in our life, worldly wisdom, Dharma wisdom, of course, wisdom is important, but why do we need this particular kind of wisdom that realizes directly and perceptually that there is no inherent existence, that things lack inherent existence? 
Why do we need to understand that? And then how is it developed? So just off the top of your head, in no kind of fancy language, why do we need the real wisdom realizing emptiness? Why do we need it? Just guessing, or some of you scholars do know the answer, so force yourself to articulate it. What's it for? What's the point of this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think um, it's logical that uh, if we um, we understand the, that everything is empty by um, themselves uh, uh, of inherent existence, we are not at attached to a self or to others or to samsara. So we aim to liberate ourselves and others. Yeah, but, definitely. It helps with attachment. Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that attachment is somehow an instrumental problem in samsara itself. And this wisdom somehow is going to help with that. You're totally going the right direction. Absolutely. Yep. All of those words, good, very good words there. <laughs> um, Angel, go ahead. Um, so I think we need it mainly because um, whenever we encounter any um, challenges in our lives, it helps us remind ourselves to take a step back and just chill and just relax into whatever it is that it's giving us a bad time. So if we realize emptiness, it helps us be at ease better. And <laughs> sorry about my dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's a very important thing you're saying there about the result of this wisdom is gonna lead to some sort of epic relaxation. Yeah. I mean, it's really like relaxation for lack of a better word, but understanding emptiness, even intellectually, helps us let go. And then imagine if we actually realized it, how much more so. So absolutely, those are those are elements. Um, Ro Roxy, go ahead. Um, well, what I've learned over the years, I guess, is just that it's, it's not that things lack um, existence in a nihilistic sort of sense but existence in the norm in the way that we think that they do so inherent existence and so if you know like according to the heart sutra um emptiness is form and form is emptiness we need form in order to understand emptiness and so we can't just live in a nihilistic void it's not that it's that it i think helps us to um maybe become less attached to things in the way that we normally think they exist, such as ourselves, which is the root of all suffering. And so it is sort of leads to, you know, the enactment in a way of the Four Noble Truths. Um, yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And, and you're pointing to the common misconception and helping to clear it up right off the bat, which is that emptiness is not nihilism that we're talking about some a characteristic that things don't have, they lack the characteristic of inherence. And, um, and that is very much instrumental to understanding and practicing the Four Noble Truths, absolutely. And um, Roxy was referencing the Heart Sutra, which is one of our go-to emptiness sutras, which really helps kind of unlock our repetitive cycles and unlock our habitual ignorance. So um, have a look at that if you haven't already. It's very important. Um, yeah, Janine, go ahead. Um, just in kind of um, general terminology, I guess I like to think of um, the 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 wisdom as being um, that things are, they have, they're labeled and, and I labeled them. And that, that the way that I perceive things is because of those labels of the, of, or those that filter that I put on things and that that can change over time. And so it's not this solid thing. And if I realize that, then it helps me to recognize that you know, something isn't necessarily um, in and of itself beautiful or ugly or, you know, disturbing or, you know, um, really great. It's, it's, it's because of, you know, the way I'm perceiving it in the moment. And so that, that helps me to, um, I think, you know, what Angela was saying, you know, let go of, you know, it's, it's just not so 
tight. I'm not so tight with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that role of yourself as the labeler is a really important piece here. And just recognizing how do things actually come into existence and how do we frame them and choose what to emphasize and decide what has significance or what doesn't. And all of these questions really important in the wisdom discussion. Yeah, Talia, go ahead. I think in the context of the six perfections, it's I like to think about the motivation of Bodhisattva would have and how you can't lead sentient beings to enlightenment if you yourself haven't achieved it. And realizing emptiness allows us to relieve our own suffering, which then gives us the ability to show others the way. Um, I know that there's two different types of Bodhisattvas. One kind of carries people along with them, you know, as they enlighten. So it might not be that you have to fully realize it before you help people, but I do think it's that's one of the really reasons it's so important because it gives you that ability. Absolutely. Whether you want nirvana liberation or whether you want enlightenment Buddhahood, either way, you're going to 100% need the wisdom realizing emptiness. Whether it's a Pali tradition goal or it's a Sanskrit tradition goal, you're definitely going to need the wisdom realizing emptiness to progress on your, on your path. And really what we're talking about is ending suffering. Why do we suffer? Ignorance, you know, is the short answer. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of how the self and phenomena exist. It's innate, it's our default setting. It's the way that we've been wired from beginningless time, but it's removable. It's completely removable. And we need to understand that it is like regular worldly ignorance where it's solved by knowledge. You know, if you're ignorant of how to, how to drive a car, you're not forever ignorant and there's not something primordially broken about you that you can't drive a car. You just haven't learned it yet. So you learn it and then you can. <laughs> and now you have a vehicle that works for you. You know, it's, it's really thinking that ignorance is not equivalent to original sin. These are false equivalencies, but it can start to sound similar if you come from traditions where that was a heavy conversation that happened a lot. So it's innate ignorance in the sense of I'm perceiving things incorrectly, but that can be corrected. It can be corrected through knowledge and wisdom. And once it's corrected, it's almost like you get to a point with it where you can't unlearn it. Yeah, it, like if you were looking at a page of words, you almost can't help but know what the words say because you've learned how to read so long ago and so well. But when you were a little kid and you were just learning to read, it took a minute and you would see those words and they wouldn't have an immediate impact on your mind, not because you were primordially not able to know words on pages and their representations in letters, but because the knowledge hadn't been familiarized enough. So now we're at the point where it's like we can't unlearn it. And that's what a realization is in a very rough sense. You can't unlearn it because it's become so stable. So we need to look at what does wisdom remedy? It remedies this default setting of ignorance. And so what does this ignorance do? Because we've never had a life without it. It's hard to imagine what life would be like if we didn't have it. But it's as if there's been a veil forever over us or that we've always been looking through a little keyhole, but there's this giant landscape of things we don't see. And the first thing that we mistake generally in life is the self. We think that the self inherently exists. And what does that mean? It means that everything we associate with self, we feel a sense of ownership of. And that goes for the good as well as the bad. Yeah, it goes for the deficiencies as well as the qualities. It goes for what feels vulnerable and what feels strong. It goes for what feels ugly and what feels beautiful. All the things that we identify with kind of create more and more and more dualism. Because as soon as you think I am ugly, that's only in reference to something you see as attractive. Or you think I am intelligent, that's only in reference to some idea of what is stupid. And you're realizing that as soon as you identify with the projections of your ignorance, 
the dualism gets worse. And th the worse our dualistic mind gets, the more agitated it is, the less happy, the less content. When you're not in over identification with all the things that projection, that ignorance projects, yeah, ignorance is like this projector of falsity and you buy into it and reinforce it and add to it. The more we do that, the harder life is, the less we do that, the easier life is. That's the very simple explanation. Okay, so, so today I'm going to go through some of the classic framings of how to really nail the correct view, the middle way, which is not falling into the extreme of nihilism or the extreme of eternalism. Because if we fall into either of those extremes, we're not giving ourselves the antidote to suffering. We're actually increasing our causes for suffering. And it's easy to fall into one of those two extremes because we've never really hit that middle way before for more than a few moments, probably. Maybe not even that. So how do you realize emptiness is the next question. You know, now we know why, why we want to cut the root of samsara. If you cut the root of samsara, you can go on to achieve liberation or Buddhahood, depending on your goal. That seems great. And all of the side effects of that being relaxation, letting go of attachment, all those wonderful side effects. That's why we want wisdom. But now how? How do we develop it? What thoughts will overcome your ignorance? What sort of thinking will get you through the veil? Is it, um, oh, I forgot, dependent origination that makes us kind of not buy it, right? Yeah. When we want something, when more we want something, uh, less we have it or um, push and um, attract something and we don't have it kind of. Oh, I had it very briefly and it, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's there, it's there, it's yeah. brewing and digesting. But the first thing you said, dependent arising, dependent. that is a very important concept. Don't lose that, dependent yeah. arising. Why are things empty? How do we realize that things are emptiness? How do we realize that things are empty of inherent existence? We see that they dependently arise. And we can see that things dependently arise with logic very easily. It just requires a good solid think. It's not actually that hard. It's just, it, we have so many eons of habit of belief in the opposite that we have to repeat and hit that same concept from a lot of different angles before it will kind of help us release into an actual realization of emptiness. So, Emptiness and dependent arising are not the same thing, but dependent arising points you to an understanding of emptiness. Dependent arising is the reason why things are empty. So we'll come back to dependent arising, but that is a huge, big, you know, highlight that term. We will come back to dependent arising. Um, what are other ways to realize emptiness or to have the wisdom realizing emptiness? How do you think your way into it? Strategies. Yeah, you go ahead. Okay, um, I think that the way I understand it, all the topics in the Lam Rim, when we meditate on them, and uh, that um, the, that's what will lead us to the wisdom of realizing emptiness. Yeah, there's a there's an important point in what you're saying. Absolutely, because all of the other topics give us the merit we need in order to have a realization. So the topic of wisdom could be enough intellectually to realize emptiness, but we can't kind of pierce through it unless we have a lot of mental momentum. And that mental momentum or that merit, that good karma, that comes from studying the rest of the path. So roughly we talk about merit in two categories. There's merit related to wisdom and merit related to method method being all the good friendly stuff, you know, patience and kindness and compassion and all that, that goes in the method category. What goes in the wisdom category is just wisdom. <laughs> but in order to have the oomph or the will to want to pierce into wisdom, 
you need to have thought about the rest of the path in some way. So the merit you create through wisdom is not the same as the merit you create through method. However, the whole path preceding the wisdom section gets you excited for it. It gets you wanting to engage with it. It strengthens the importance and the need for it. So in that way, you're, you're quite right, Eve. Yeah, the rest of the path leads to that. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to sit with because the thing about accumulating merit or good karma in two different categories, the reason for that is that there's two levels of reality. There's the level of reality that is deceptive because we have a deception that we create ourselves, right? The deceptive quality is not from the side of the reality. The deceptive quality is from the side of ourselves. And then we have reality as it is. And reality as it is, is called ultimate truth. Reality as it is, is that everything is empty. But we have only ever lived with an appearance of relative truth, which is deceptive. But while it's deceptive, we can still do ethics and kindness. So everything we do under the heading of relative truth for the path goes into the merit of method, yeah, or the accumulation of method karma. Yeah. Um, everything we do to realize emptiness goes into the basket of wisdom accumulation and falls under the heading of ultimate truth. Yeah, so if you're working on ultimate truth, you get wisdom merit. If you're working on relative truth, you get method merit. Interesting conversation. It's all just your mind. It's all just your mind, <laughs> you know, but it, it is interesting to sit with because sometimes the relationship between the two, we don't talk about a lot. We talk about the method side and the warm fuzzies and the beautiful and the altruistic. And then we talk about the wisdom and the analytical and the intellectual and all of that. But it's very important to realize that to want to go through the effort to realize emptiness, you need a lot of bodhicitta. Yeah, or at least a lot of renunciation. Yeah, if you're not going to do it for all sentient beings, at least want to do it to get yourself out of this mess. So it's going to take a lot of renunciation and hopefully renunciation and bodhicitta to want to realize emptiness. Yeah, uh, other thoughts on how? So I have a question about um, suffering and wanting the liberation. Of, because sometimes when you are, you are feeling good and you don't know, uh, you are ignorant and you just live a beautiful life, you don't want really to end it. So, but sometimes when you have suffering and you are detached because of suffering because of grief and all these things so you want to 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 know why and you want to end it and end the suffering of others too because you you begin to see everybody somehow they suffer even the rich people even healthy people they will lost it and they will so can we say that <laughs> bad things are good in some some way like bad things that we think that they are bad they are aren't really bad because they lead us to something beautiful and want knowing uh, and wisdom and some theoretically <laughs> yes <laughs> theoretically <laughs> yeah not from their own side but the, the potential is there for yeah. suffering to motivate us to engage with the path but suffering also can motivate us to give up or motivate us to be hedonistic or, you know, it's like that itself, none of it inherently exists, but a hundred percent, it can be the it catalyst be. we need to get off our bum. Mm. And that's because the right way to think about it, right? That's the correct way to think about it is this suffering is very useful for momentum and engagement on the path. But to think that the suffering from its own side will give you momentum and engagement on the path is taking it no. too far. Yeah, because sometimes suffering depends on people. Sometimes suffering make you like more ignorant. You want to harm others or. Yeah, or disassociate and, you know, various addictions manifest. And oh, yeah, you know, so people's approach to suffering is as varied as people. 
but you're thinking about it the right way that for you, suffering is going to be the catalyst to reconnect with your path again and again. And that is the right way to think about it. Yeah. But for uh, a, a, a Buddha, which is not suffering because he's perfect, it's the, the other way of wisdom, the perfection of the wisdom that make a Buddha be a Buddha. But we don't know if, uh, uh, right, we know that Buddha had suffered a lot, all the Buddhas, but they have merit because of their wisdom, right? They, they have merit because, because of, of their suffering. Yeah. 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 So they've overcome their suffering, but it's not like they don't oh. remember. <laughs> they remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they yeah. remember. And what's more, they see ours and they want us to not suffer anymore. Yeah. You know, it's sometimes it's a little bit like if you um, think about, you know, starving people in some country or someone that's just been hit by a natural disaster, your heart goes out to them. But if you're there on the ground and you're seeing them, suddenly you're motivated and you think, oh, my gosh, OK, I have to fundraise. I have to find clean water. And you really want to help. So the Buddhas are a little bit like that, where they are seeing our suffering and they want to help us get out of it by offering us all the possible tools that we can access at our level. You know, they're not passive like us watching the news. They're active like we would be if we were on the ground seeing the suffering and just, you know, in there with bandages, do whatever we can, you yeah. know? So they're not, they're not disengaged just because they're not suffering anymore. Um, Talia, go ahead. Uh, regarding the how question, I heard a teacher say something that was sort of small and easy for me to grab onto to think about emptiness. And it was, um, it's not really like that. Like things I perceive, people I perceive, situations, just remember, oh, it's not really like that. And it helps loosen up my grasping to what I think something is. Yeah, that's a really good advice. And, and having a short version to talk to yourself about in your daily life about emptiness really helps. Um, another is to think, you have your strong opinion about this or that or this or that, then add on the end of it, merely labeled by the mind. <laughs> yeah, this weather is horrible, merely labeled by the mind. This staff meeting is horrible, merely labeled by the mind, you know, and it immediately chills you out. Yeah. Um, or you think not from its own side, not in and of itself, you know, just a little short pithy phrase to hit you in your daily life when you see yourself get hooked by the lie once again, when you find yourself believing the projection once again, just to release. Um, when I used to practice Zen, my Zen teacher used to say to me, not always necessarily so, whenever I found the answer to a question, I'd say, so is it like this? And he'd say, not always necessarily so. Yeah, and so sometimes I say that in my head when I feel very convinced, yes, especially if it's a grumpy, intense feeling of rightness, then not always necessarily so. Just soften the edges of that grasping however you can. Yeah. So, so okay, so now I'll dig into it. I won't force you to think too hard. Now you can just listen for a little bit, but some of you have heard these teachings many times, and some of you have only heard them a few times. Just let it brew and see if you can find one or two points of resonance that you can really take into your daily life, because this is one of the most important teachings in Buddhism. So one day is not nearly enough to cover it, but if at least you feel like the seeds you have are getting watered, that's really important. So why do we need the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence? Because when conjoined with the perfection of concentration, it leads to the profound realization that is the direct antidote to suffering and cyclic existence itself. That's why we need it. And if we want to be a Buddha, we need to get out of cyclic existence. If we want nirvana, we need out of cyclic existence. So that is our essential key step there. And then how is it developed? A correct intellectual understanding is developed and then repeatedly meditated on. So you understand it just through study and chatting and thinking about it like we are now. And then once you come to some clarity with it, you repeat and you repeat and you repeat, and then conjoined with calm abiding or the perfection of concentration meditation practice we talked about last week. 
So that single pointedness, you bring in what you've understood analytically, once your single pointedness has been perfected, and the unification of those two leads to that direct antidote. So it starts with what we're doing. Yeah, we're just having a good think, getting clearer, and then repeating. So you need this calm abiding, right? We only briefly looked at this, but in order to realize emptiness directly, you need a stable, stable mind. So this little monk, which is us, with his mindfulness and his introspection, his hook and his lasso, chasing the crazed elephant and the crazy monkey and the silly rabbit all the way up the path, this is just our mind's development bringing our negative states of mind and our obstacles gradually more and more under control until we have perfect ease of concentration. So when we have perfect ease of concentration, then we can conjoin it with our realization of emptiness. So, you know, just kind of to make it more accessible, think about how if you get a really interesting idea and then you wanna hang on to it, how hard it is to hang on to it if your mind is attached. You know, you, you listen to some cool TED talk, you, wrote, you read something interesting on, in the paper and you really wanted to remember it. But unless your mind was really focused and settled, you might lose it even if it was very interesting. And you're trying to remember when you get home and you're trying to remember when you're gonna tell your friend and it's just, it's gone. And that doesn't mean you didn't understand it and it doesn't mean you didn't like it. You liked it and you understood it, but you still couldn't remember and hold it and integrate it because you didn't have enough stability of mind because your concentration hadn't been developed enough. So don't beat yourself up. It's the natural human condition. We just really need to make a project of cultivating concentration because otherwise our insights lack power. We might actually be quite good students, quite sharp cookies, understand a lot, but it can't integrate because there's no stability there to bring it to. Yeah, so it's really important that we remember concentration's a project to not leave behind and to really consider what in our life interrupts our concentration or makes us more habituated to sense objects and more distracted and to start eliminating more and more of those. And without any heaviness, remembering that People have been the same from the dawn of time, we get distracted. These little images that you see on the path, this little conch is perfume and these little symbols are music and this mirror represents form. And there's some apples and various things and sensory objects like cloth. These represent the objects of our five senses which tempt us off the path because they will give us temporary happiness but we need long-term happiness and stability to benefit ourselves as well as all sentient beings. But you know, you look at this path and you should think, I'm not different or weird than human beings have ever been. It's not my iPad's fault. I would always find something to distract my mind with, but let's consciously try not to. Okay, <clears throat> so there are a few methods that help us access the reality of the self and all phenomena. So to understand why the self and phenomena are empty of inherent existence, you have to do a few steps. So one really essential step is recognizing the object to be negated. One essential step is recognizing dependent arising. And one important step is understanding the fallacy of belief in inherent existence and the logic of the emptiness of it. So there's a lot of techniques and strategies to realize emptiness, but most of them or all of them will boil down to points related to these three. Okay, so, you know, it'll be a little fast, but um, pop in if you want to clarify something, just unmute and jump in. Do the first one. So recognizing the object to be negated, sometimes called the object to be refuted. The object is the self. And what is negated is it having the characteristic of being inherently existent. We recognize it, we recognize that object to be neg negated through provoking it into prominence. 
by remembering past moments of our strong belief in it, and then going on to disprove that self's existence in an inherent way through logic. So this is a really important step, recognizing the object to be negated. So what you're wanting to do is provoke it, because if you're not particularly afflicted that day, if you're not upset, not too excited, the sense of being inherently existent isn't shouting at you. You're not walking around saying, I'm inherently existent. You're not. But as soon as you're provoked in a good way or a bad way, the self roars into life and says, I am inherently existent, even though it doesn't use those words. So when you're meditating, you don't want it to take over that feeling of I or self, but you want to kind of nudge it until it shows itself. So whatever analogy you like, um, some of you will know I like the analogy of a cop show. Okay, <laughs> so the object of negation is the perp. Yeah, the perpetrator in the cop show. And then you've got good cop and bad cop interrogating them until the perpetrator cracks and says, yes, I did it. Yes, I did it. Okay, so you got your perp and he really thinks he exists in the way he appears, right? The object of negation really believes in its inheritance. And in order to get it to sh see the silliness, you can't come in all guns blazing. You got to sweet talk it a little bit. Yeah, you have to do good cop. Yeah, and say, you know what? You are smart. You're very smart. You have learned many things in your life. You're a good little self, you know, right? <laughs> like it sounds ridiculous, but you have to make the self feel relaxed enough to be analyzed. Because if it gets defensive right away, you're not going to be able to really touch the problem because there's just too much emotion clouding the whole scene. Okay, so when you're trying to meditate on the object of negation, kind of hunt around for characteristics about yourself that feel particularly me. You know, for some people, it's their nationality. Others couldn't care less about their nationality. For some people, it's their gender. Other people do not care about their gender. That's not an identity point for them. For some people, they care about their level of intelligence or how they appear to others or their sense of humor or their sense of style or their financial status or whatever it is, some sort of surface surface self, which is not even getting to the conventional self. It's like the facade, but start there, you know, just kind of tweak at it. Like if someone said to you, oh my gosh, you are so old, would you laugh or be annoyed? <laughs> or if someone said to you, oh my gosh, you are so young, would you laugh or be annoyed? Because sometimes people affiliate self with that. If someone says to you, you are so gorgeous, would you be indifferent? Or would you be like, oh, thank you? Or would you be like, oh no, I'm not. But what would happen to you? Indifference or caring? So if you care, that's the point of investigation. If you don't care, you leave that one aside and say, okay, that's not a trigger point for me. Yeah. So find your trigger points and then kind of poke it a little bit until you feel how very you you feel when thinking of that. How very you-ness you feel. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have to kind of hold this impression of you. Yes. This impression of like, maybe it's just your name. Sometimes our name is what'll do it. And you just say your own name in your head to yourself until you feel like there's this like little tiny version of you that's like directing your limbs or something. And you say, you, you feel so solid. Show yourself. Yeah, you who feel so solid, prove it. So if you did exist so solidly, then you would either be the same as your parts or different to your parts. Yeah, if you did exist just like that, one with or separate from the aggregates, yes, if we're doing the four keys in the technical language. But think of it really simply like, okay, so if I am solidly inherently I, then my body and my characteristics and my learning should all be also I. Can I find anything that is that? Hmm, okay, that's weird. 
to say that my elbow is I and my nose is I and all of these parts are I. Does that mean I am as many eyes as there are parts? As many selves as there are parts? What is making them come together and not disperse? That's very strange. How does this work? And so then you think, okay, that doesn't make sense to think that I am like one with all of my parts. So I must be separate. There must be all the parts of Yuntin and then Yuntin in the center being able to label them. Yeah, or Yuntin in the center, the owner of them or the puppeteer above them. Yeah, that's the way it feels. So you say, okay, if that's the case, where are you? <laughs> where are you puppeteer? Where are you? And so you sit and you think, all right, I, who is the boss I, the boss? Yeah, there's the five aggregates and then there's the self. There's some extra sort of sixth aggregate who is in charge of everybody else. Where are you? And so you sit and you think and you go, oh, maybe the I is my thoughts. Which ones? <laughs> Which thoughts? And you think, all right, yeah, okay. The I is my thoughts. Where do my thoughts come from? They come from previous moments of thinking. They come from outer stimuli. They come from nature, nurture, conditioning, karma. They come from many, many places, my thoughts. How can something coming from many other places be an inherent self? That's nuts. And so then the self is embarrassed and like, all right, all right, I'm not that, okay. You know, and you just keep teasing it until it kind of dissolves into, okay, fine, I'm not inherently existent. I dependently arise. <laughs> and you find the non-finding of an inherent self. So this is how you play with the object of negation. You have to find it, get it to prove itself. When it can't, it collapses. You with me? Questions? Yeah, Talia, go ahead. So you went up to thoughts and then there's a there's that which can observe the thoughts, right? And observe we're all observing each other. There seems to be something, even I can trace back to when I was really little, that felt like I could observe the world, even if I didn't know a lot, there was something that was observing it. So how do you not like what is the introspection? Like, how do you poke that? I guess because it's almost elusive as to what it even is, but it's been there for so long, it feels. Yeah, yeah. And that is what will happen. And, you know, I just stopped at thoughts because we only have an hour, but it's, it's really that you turn to anything that feels like the boss. So in this case, you're feeling like your ability to discern and recognize and label is the boss. And that's a mental factor. It's a mental factor which is also thought, yes, broadly speaking, it's all under the category of thought. And in every moment you have at least five mental factors, usually more operating. So this is why then you realize teachings on sem sem chung or minds and mental factors and understanding the way the mind works is really useful in understanding emptiness. Because if you don't understand the interaction of the different aspects of your mind, it's easy to decide that one is in charge and is somehow core. You know, for some people, they feel like they are their feelings. Yeah, especially teenagers, yes? Feeling, the way I feel is me. But where do feelings come from? Feelings come from previous karma ripening, present moment stimuli and conditions, associations, discriminations, and how you got there and how all those things came together. So you're having a feeling, but you are not feeling. You're having a feeling, you know, feeling is happening here, but the self is not feeling. Yeah. And you know, what you're feeling is very much related to how you describe it to yourself and how you relate it to yourself and what you've decided it means to you. You know, and so you go, okay, okay, so feeling exists, but I'm not feeling. Discrimination, recognition exists, but I am not discrimination, recognition. Oh, I must be intention. I must be the part of the mind that moves towards or away. I must be the chooser, the, you know, the choices that I make. That must be me. And then you think, have any choices I've made ever been made alone? Spontaneously, causelessly, from factors unrelated to me. No, 
nothing ever has. No choice was made independent of context, independent of cause, independent of conditioning. All choices were made under the influence of countless causes and conditions. But you did make the choice. It is your choice. You have to you know, have the good or bad consequences of it. So this is where we have this dance between relative and ultimate truth. And it's, it becomes really interesting in investigation to do. So when you're doing this object of negation, the, the going too far would be thinking, therefore there is no self whatsoever. That's going too far. What you wanna to come to is it is impossible for the self to be inherent. Yeah, the only self that can exist is a dependently arisen self or a self that is merely labeled on the collection of parts. But anything more than that is an exaggeration and going into the other extreme of uh, eternalism. Yeah, or an extreme of grasping at permanence. Yeah, and when we say the extreme of permanence in this context, permanence means slightly different than when we normally talk about permanence, side note. But you know, it, it becomes very interesting because the deeper you go, the more you kind of get used to checking and releasing. That seems like the self, oh no, wait, no, it's dependent on this and this and this and this, release. What about this? Checking, checking, checking and release. And you get better and better at doing that. And eventually what you'll come to is the mind itself or awareness itself, sort of that spacious clarity that is reflective that seems to contain the mental factors or hold the mental factors. Yes, the sky that holds the clouds, that's what seems to be. And then you realize that for that sky-like nature of consciousness to exist, there needs to be things that reflect in it. So even that, not inherent. So recognizing the object of negation is a really good kind of launch into seeing the lack of inherently existent self. Because if you just say to yourself, I don't inherently exist, does that have impact on your mind every day? Some days it's like, huh, all right, well, I'm still mad at that guy though. <laughs> no. But if you're meditating on the object of negation, you start to question who was harmed in that you know, awful argument? Who was it that was harmed? Who was the harmer? What happened even to frame it in that way? In what situation would this be conflict? In what situation would it be a conversation? You know, and then you're starting to really get some flexibility of mind and to stop reinforcing the stories you say to yourself. But it's delicate because you don't want to go too far either way. And all of these conversations are personal, private conversations. When you're with people who are very attached to some aspect of their identity, do not challenge them, <laughs> right? Unless they want to, unless they're up for playing, you know? If they wanna play, then fun, that's great. That's a great debate. But if someone says to you, you know, I'm like this because of my Irish ancestors, you know that you're like, all right, sort of, maybe, probably not, but anyway, let them have it, it's fine. <laughs> Right? Let them have it if they need to. I'm like this because of my Irish ancestors. That's why I love potatoes. That's why. You're like, well, possibly one of the many reasons why you love potatoes, but also potatoes are inherently delicious. So, right. But, you know, so when people are really obsessed with identity features, it's usually because something that they're presenting has been really rejected by the society that they're in or really rejected by the family structure they're in. So it's like, we wouldn't care about the color of our eyes unless someone hated the color of our eyes. And then suddenly it would be something to reconcile. You know what I mean? So, you know, if someone said to me, oh, people with green eyes are disgusting and horrible. I'd be like, but I have green eyes and I, I don't wanna be disgusting and horrible. You think I'm disgusting and horrible just because of my eyes? I can't help my eyes, should I wear contacts? Ugh. You could go into a whole neurotic spin and then come out the other end and realize that their thinking was nonsense, get mad at them and decide to build a whole culture of green eyed people to support each other through the societal prejudices that hate the green eyed people. And it would be nourishing and it would be safe and it would be a kind place to be in and why would you take that from the poor green-eyed people 
if the rest of society hates them. Yeah, even though you know there is nothing inherently good or bad about green eyes. You know that the society oppresses those who have it, so let them have their culture to support each other and be safe. You know, or even the conception of what is green and what is blue and what is brown and where do we call it on the spectrum. Yeah, so this is gonna be an analogy for a million different things, but when people feel like they're getting fixated on an identity point, it's usually because there's some aspect of society that rejects that. So kindness is so important. You know, there's a lot of conversations around neurodiversity right now, for example, and lots of people might say, hey, I've just realized I'm autistic. And then you think, OK, but I'm not going to let you off the hook for being rude to me, you know, <laughs> right. And, you know, you get the grumble of, oh, God, not one more thing to deal with. Oh, PC culture, grumble, grumble. Right. This can happen. But what you want to realize is they're trying to communicate something to us about the way we hurt each other. Yeah, we hurt each other when we don't accept certain behaviors, certain appearances, certain affects. And when you don't accept people, then those little points of identity flare into prominence and become very important. Whereas if they were just accepted, they would just fade to the background of one of a million traits you could say about a person. Do you know what I'm saying? So be kind to other people about their identity, even as you try to destroy yours. Yes, good, okay, moving on. Okay, so this one is easier-ish, easier-ish. Um, another way to realize the perfection of wisdom is recognizing dependent arising. How do you recognize dependent arising? You think about how all impermanent phenomena so everything that changes depends on causes and conditions in order to arise. So this is very easy. We know this from science. Everything needs a substantial cause, like the main thing that makes it, and everything needs conditions, like uh, the facilitating factors, the nourishing factors for it to come into existence. And this is in reference to changing phenomena or compounded phenomena specifically. The other two are related to all phenomena, including permanent things. So the surface level we see just with science, we see with our life, you think about that. The second level is all permanent and impermanent phenomena depend on parts and whole, as well as context in order to arise. So this is where we talk about the idea of a whole something depends on there being parts to make it a whole something. And for something to be considered parts, it needs to be parts of something we consider a whole. Yes? Um, and context in the sense of to say this is a large room is only in reference to the kitchen, which is a smaller room. But in terms of houses that are bigger than this one, this is a smaller room. So we say small and large or good and bad only in reference to, which proves how it can't inherently exist. And then all permanent and impermanent phenomena depend on mind's imputation on a valid basis. And that's the one that requires the most kind of deep thought and kind of going back over it. So it's really interesting to, to do a deep dive into whichever one of these is striking a chord and see if you can weave that into your daily life. But it's really coming down to the reason why things are empty. Things are empty because they depend. They're empty of inherent existence because they have a dependent existence. Is it making sense? These three levels? So it's quick. Um, and Angel is asking what's an example of permanent phenomena. An example of permanent phenomena is uncompounded space. Um, Uncompounded space does not change moment to moment, but um, permanent doesn't mean eternal in Buddhism necessarily. It doesn't mean forever. It means while it exists, it doesn't go under change. So like there is space in my cup, but that's, and that space in my cup is not changing, but it can cease to exist as soon as I pour water in my glass. 
Yeah, but while the, while the glass is empty, there is permanent space in glass. Yeah, unchanging space in glass. Yeah. So like this, um, it's a good question. So, you know, mostly we talk about impermanent things in Buddhism, because those are the things that give us grief. <laughs> but there are also many permanent things as well. Yeah. So, you know, I think the one that works best in daily life in terms of dependent arising is looking at context. So this is where we have the conversation about how all villains become sympathetic figures once you learn their backstory. Yes. So, you know, you can, whatever Marvel, DC, whatever Star Wars sort of movies you've been watching and there's the scary guy and then they run out of things to say in the story so then they have to do prequels and do origin stories and then you're like oh wow that's so poignant the poor joker oh undiagnosed mental illness and trauma oh the joker that's rough man of course he was like that <laughs> yes backstory ruins villains yes um and you know, it's, it's good to use silly contemporary examples, but it is absolutely true in our daily life, isn't it? That once you learn somebody's story, you are a lot more sympathetic. They don't trigger you as badly. You don't get so mad at them once you understand their context. If you understand why something is important, you can let it become more important to you or not. But the reason why helps. You know, context also helps us understand why people fixate on certain things, like, say, antique dealers. You're looking at a teacup. It's a pretty teacup. You could get it at Ikea, but this one is worth $10,000. Why is this teacup so important? The context they brought to it and the significance they attributed to it. Now it has value in their eyes. But if you have no interest in antiques, it doesn't magically have that significance for you, does it? But because of the context they know about it and the context they bring to it, it has this incredible value. And it does have that value, relatively speaking. But for someone who doesn't care or know, it's just a cup. Its value is in how well it holds the beverage. Yeah. And if you're an ant, completely disinterested. Shall I build a nest here or not? Yes. So this one helps a lot because whenever we get really tight about our story, we feel like it has to be true. It feels so true to me. And as soon as you realize it only feels true to you because of all of the conditions you brought to this moment, but that from its own side, it does not have self-existent importance. It's much easier to let it go. And how much would that thinking help us during these pandemic days? We all had plans that failed. <laughs> Yes, we all had many plans of things we were going to be doing by now, or things that we were going to be doing last year, or ways of life or ways of being. Lots of interruptions, lots of annoyance. Yeah, even if we didn't have any horrible health scare, even if we didn't have any family tragedy, it's been a giant inconvenience. But how upset we are in response to that inconvenience is very much about how we framed it to ourselves. If we framed life as, I cannot connect to people on Zoom, I just can't, it's not the same, it's not real, then you've made that true for yourself. <laughs> and if you've decided, wait, they're still human beings, look, we're having an interaction. It's different, it's new, but actually I get to see all of the classmates' faces so clearly. Before, I'd have to like turn and really look at them up and down and that would be weird and distracting. Yes, <laughs> so there's actually some fun benefits in class this way etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know like how grumbly you are about it is very much about your framing and you knew this in some form before you ever met buddhism yeah you knew about context before you were a buddhist so you know it's just taking that knowledge that you already had and deepening it and expanding it and making it more and more vast and realizing there is almost infinite contextuality and that does not negate ethics, that does not gate, negate harmful, helpful. Things are still harmful or helpful given their context, but you're also recognizing that divorce from context, things aren't exactly as they seem the same to everyone. So delicate, yeah, this is all very delicate. Do you have any thoughts about the dependent arising strategy? 
or questions. I'll pop it up on the screen and you can just uh, jump in if you have a thought. So we call these uh, causal dependency, mutual dependency, and dependency through mere designation. So that's one strategy. Um, use as you like. And then this last one, this is just looking at the fallacy of belief in inherent existence. Yeah, that it's just incorrect. It's absurd that we believe in inherent existence. We have this natural innate projecting of it. We have this natural innate appearance of it, but we also believe it. We believe what we see. And we need to kind of unpack that by looking at the logic of emptiness. So these three points are saying basically the same thing. They're just hitting it from different angles. So we first just sit with things do not exist inherently or have a natural as in causeless existence, because if they did, they would not have to depend upon other factors. They could spontaneously arise out of nowhere. So things do not exist inherently or they would have a natural causeless existence. Is there anything that just pops out of nowhere with no cause whatsoever? There isn't. No thought, no person, no flower, no rock, nothing just popped out of nowhere spontaneously without causes. And then we think of the another angle, which is things are not established by way of their own characteristics. So everything has characteristics. Everything has features, qualities, things that you reference it by, but they are not established by those. Because if they did, they wouldn't need to be imputed by language and conception because they would already exist because of their own characteristics. So like characteristics would equal creation. And this is sort of the way it feels sometimes. Like if you have all the ingredients together, you have the cake, but the ingredients don't make the cake. The ingredients have to come together in a particular way under particular circumstances. Then you bake it and you make it and then you label it cake. But it's, it's not like the ingredients of cake made it from its own side. There still had to be a mind to meet it and impute cake there on that finished product. Yeah, and it sometimes feels to us like if we just had the ingredients of things together, then the thing is there from its own side, but no, we have to impute. Yeah, so then things do not exist from their own side, meaning from the side of the basis for designating it. Because if they did, then there would have to be something that is an illustration of it that you can find amongst the basis for imputation in or on that basis like a, a little magnet calling its label to it or something. So it's just kind of looking at how it's absurd to believe in the projections. And the easiest analogy is to think about how we are when we look in the mirror. When we look in the mirror, we see a whole other face looking at us, but we do not for a moment believe there is a whole other face. So it does appear that way. It appears like there's another face, but we do not believe in the other face in that flat object. If we were a cat, we might be confused. Yeah, and think there's a whole other cat there and start a fight or make friends. So we're a little bit like the cat where there's this appearance, but we don't know what to make of it. So sometimes we're believing the appearance. It appears to be another cat. It must be another cat. Fight with the other cat, love the other cat but it's just you bouncing back at yourself, yeah? So what we're trying to train in doing is realizing that things will appear to be inherently existent for a very, very long time, but we can stop believing in it. We can start to recognize just because it looks like a face in the mirror doesn't mean there's a whole other face in that flat object. It just looks like that, but I don't believe I've split into two. Yeah. Or um, sometimes they say, like, um, if you're looking at a mountain and you're wearing sunglasses, it looks like the snow mountain is blue, but you know that it only looks blue because you're wearing glasses. So you see blue, but you don't believe blue, you know white. 
Yes. So this is how we're trying to train. Just because it appears inherently existent doesn't mean you have to believe that it's inherently existent. The appearance is going to continue to be deceptive until we're completely realized emptiness directly. And even then, only the appearance of emptiness will appear in meditation. Then once we're out of meditation, things will still appear truly existent for quite some time until full enlightenment. We just won't believe it as much. It's like we'll let go and let go and let go. Yeah, so repetition, repetition, but this is kind of the way to start thinking of it is things will appear inherently existent, but don't believe that they're inherently existent. Just like my face appears in the mirror, but I don't need to believe that there's another face there. Yeah, Lara? If um, I imagine like in, in everyday life, because in, it's interesting to put it in an everyday life and go with the uh, material that we have in everyday life. Um, does it mean that you don't, uh, like you see others sometimes like your projection when you feel bad, other people, they seem to you like they are not very uh, good person or they are not, they don't have good intention. Um, but sometimes in real life, people, they don't have good intention. Even if you are like um, rest enough, you're not tired and you're not judging them. Or, uh, how to do with this, um, this part? Because sometimes in life, everything goes very fast and uh, you just right jump to the not fight it's not always like that but it's like manipulation or uh yeah. you know the story of everyday life yeah yeah no you, you just have to remember worldly wisdom is still worldly wisdom if you know that certain behaviors mean a person is likely going to hurt you you don't have to throw away that worldly wisdom but what you're trying to do is to soften the edges of your opinions so much so that Whatever is the case, whether they're helpful or harmful, that doesn't become a condition for your mind to be disturbed. Mm -hmm. So we can never know what people's motivations are without clairvoyance. So you could see someone with a very grumpy face and make a worldly wisdom assessment. They must be grumpy, but you don't know. They might be sad. They might just have that face. Many things might be happening. But even if they are really grumpy, if you're thinking they're inherently grumpy and that is inherently disagreeable and rude and therefore I have no choice to be upset in response, you've started a whole story that does not exist from its own side and gotten yourself upset and frustrated needlessly. So you're just trying to give yourself space for the fact that there are always more possibilities in the story than what you've trained yourself to believe, but that doesn't mean you need to throw out what you've trained yourself to observe. Yeah, but it, it does it mean that you don't react as fast as automatically to people react as always? You react You differently. just take this stance, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th this is the sort of thing that weaves into your daily life gradually, but mm -hmm. it has to be things you think about in quiet moments where it's not busy and crazy and instinctual knee-jerk times. If you're mm -hmm. thinking about this a lot in quiet moments, then the next time you're stuck in traffic, you're not gonna fall into the trap of thinking, I have to be stressed now because traffic is stressful. <laughs> you know, you can be like, there's traffic. <laughs> it can be a condition for stress or not. <laughs> this could be considered traffic in this country, but in another country, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Not from its own side, you know? And it's yeah. like, all right, but still there's cars there and you have to be careful but it doesn't have to have the whole story that you always put on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so don't, you, you don't feel like you need to let go of all of your knowings and understandings of the world. You keep those, but then you weave in more possibilities, which really helps your mind not be so upset. Yeah, mm -hmm. or so grasping. Yeah. Yes, so, thank you. Yeah, of course. And, um, you know, the summary to all of this to make it, you know, as direct as possible, when we're looking at these three steps is to just go straight to the king of reasons 
which is that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. And you could just memorize that sentence and think about it and think about it and think about it. Yeah. This is um, not a Zen koan, but it's our Galukpa Tibetan Buddhist version <laughs> of a Zen koan. You know, if you hear someone say, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Why are they saying that? They're saying you can't have the sound of a clap without the condition of another hand. Yeah, it's helping you understand dependent arising. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? This is it's to make you go into sound only exists if there's someone to hear sound, which only exists if I'm framing that as sound, which only, which only, which only dependent arising, dependent arising proves emptiness. Right, so Zen Cohen's are to help your mind kind of become playful about understanding that nothing is from its own side. Nothing is existing by way of its own characteristics. Nothing is inherent, but that doesn't mean nothingness. It can mean everythingness, yeah, possibilityness. That's a better framing. So we'll have a short break and then we'll do a meditation. Five minutes.
Okay, come on back. Okay, just take a minute and settle into the posture. Straight back as best as you can. And make a few intentional breaths, just settling the body. And then shift to analysis. So first, we're just going to explore this idea of recognizing the object to be negated. So first, we reflect on how the self seems inherent, especially when we're upset. So just start there. Even though you know where this is going, try not to skip to the end. Just stay with, it really does feel like the characteristics of me make me or that I made my characteristics. Like there was a core me that was a little magnet that attracted certain qualities and experiences. Or maybe it's like all the characteristics were a box of Legos and I put them together in this way and now here I am. Like there's a little piece of self attached to each characteristic I identify with. The part that thinks, I am what thinks, I am what speaks, I am what moves and breathes, I am my thoughts, I am how I think them and the moods that carry them. Feels like there is an I attached to all of these things and yet all of these things are changing constantly, interconnected, inner and outer stimuli. Where is the self in amongst all of that? And you might think the self is the experiencer or the self is the experiences. The experiences are events in time that have passed. And the experiencer is just one aspect that we've given significance to. One day it might be the feeling in the body is the experiencer. Another day, a thought in the mind is the experiencer. So what's the self? Is it either of those, both of those?
And you think all of those things, they dependently arise. All of the stimuli, all of the stories, all of the history and characteristics, we're all coming together and a coming together and another coming together. Threads and threads of stories. And we can label self there on those parts just very gently, merely labeled by the mind. But if we think that there is more self than that mere label on those parts, we've exaggerated. There is not a carpenter self building a house of self gathering friends to the self, kicking enemies out from the house of self. There is just movement, connection, disconnection, all just merely labeled by the mind on this basis or that basis. And so you think this self cannot be inherently existent because it would either need to be one with all these parts or separate independent of them. And neither is the case. The self is labeled on the parts, nothing more. And this is because the self dependently arises. And others dependently arise. And all phenomena dependently arise. The phenomena within my own mind, the outer phenomena of the natural world, everything dependently arising. So it's a fallacy to believe in inherent existence, even though it's perfectly natural that the world would seem that way, that our own identity would seem that way, that our mind would seem that way, totally natural. We have innate ignorance. But just because we have ignorance doesn't mean we need to reinforce it or believe in the projections of it. The fact of emptiness is freedom. Freedom from stories and clinging free from push and pull. Free from fear. And so if we realize that emptiness, we can access that freedom. And so think all of the energy you put into these thoughts, as well as all of the energy you put into all six perfections, goes towards the integration of all of them within yourself, as well as radiating out to all living beings. Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 Om Mani 
dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. You can relax your attention. Okay, thanks very much everyone. And uh, this is the last session of the series. And uh, next month is all Jado Rinpoche all the time. <laughs> so that's what's happening at Land of Medicine Buddha in December is uh, many, many very cool Jado Rinpoche teachings. He's gonna teach three principal aspects of the path. He's going to teach um, Recognizing My Mother, which is an amazing text on emptiness. And it's very beautiful poetry. So I really recommend if you're curious about emptiness, go to those Recognizing My Mother teachings. They're beautiful. And um, he'll also be doing some very cool tantra things as well for those of you that feel ready for that as well as a connection with him. So I really recommend that. And then in January, I'll be doing a, a little bit more programming for Land of Medicine Buddha before I go back to Israel. So. Um, hopefully see you around and uh, I'll probably be back to California next year around uh, September so if I don't see you in January hopefully I see you in September so thanks everybody and uh, Roxy's saying I'm leaving I'm leaving it was always the plan that I would leave for six months every six months I go to Israel but um, theoretically I'll be back for six months again at Land of Medicine Buddha so theoretically <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks so much for having me. It's been really lovely in California. And uh, recommendations you. are, uh, let's see, Emptiness and Relative Truth and Ultimate Truth by Geshe Teshi Sering. Very good follow-up books. So thank you, guys. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.